Hello everyone! Welcome to the second annual Troy Talks. I hope everyone is staying happy and healthy during these unprecedented times. Troy Talks is a program organized by the Troy Teen Advisory Board from the Troy Public Library. This year we are joined by speakers from around the world who will share their thoughts and passions. We are excited to bring to you the thoughts of students and featured speakers alike. We hope you enjoy! We all have habits we want to break. Some habits can be small distractions in our lives, and others can be a barrier between our happiness. Me personally, I found myself falling into countless unhealthy and time-wasting habits. After all, we've been programmed to depend on falling into this system of reward and behavior by something called the positive and negative reinforcement process. We can explain this process by a behavior you may be familiar with. Uh, let's say you walk in the kitchen, maybe open the fridge and pantry and see food. You have some and notice it tastes good and it makes you feel good too. Next thing you know, you're back at where you found this food and you decide to eat it again. Based on your previous experience, you wait for a trigger, which is your hunger, proceed to do a behavior, eating, notice that quick hit of dopamine you received and repeat this process. The more you do it, the more likely you are to do it next time. And that is the birth of a habit. It can be good or bad. The problem with this process is once that trigger changes. The first time you ate that food was because you were hungry, but this time you're pretty bored and you have nothing to do. So you want to the kitchen, uh, have that same food and experience the same applause you get from your brain. But in actuality, the habit's just getting worse and worse. Let's take a major problem within the realm of people's habits and arrive at a big one, procrastination. Some can say we all do it, Yet again, for many, it's not noticeable within their day-to-day -day lives, but for some, it's the fictitious prison they've made that continues to separate them from their goals. Many try forcing themselves out of this cycle, but with no luck. What if, instead of sheer discipline, we use a different part of our brain that works curiosity instead? What if we use the exact process, but alter the ending? Let's walk through the typical procrastination scenario. You have to sleep at 11 p.m., let's say. It's late and you have work to do, but before you can sleep, what are you doing? You are scrolling that Instagram, or TikTok, or whatever kids are into these days. What if instead of stopping work, feeling bored, picking up your phone, and wasting a lot of time, you stopped doing work, started feeling bored, picked up your phone, but then stopped yourself? This time, you are very curious about the processes that are occurring in your brain in that very moment. And you start thinking about what really made you want to pick up your phone. You've been in your seat for hours and the trigger was your body. Turns out you just needed to stretch or get up for a bit of a walk. Instead, you picked up your phone and switched your focus from work to phone. Instead of focusing on why you felt like you needed to switch from work to phone in the first place. Seeing what we get from our habits helps us stop them sooner on in the positive and negative reinforcement process you just become not as interested in performing the bad behavior. This simple yet powerful change can be the mindfulness you need to stopping that one bad behavior, or many more bad behaviors, and soon that one moment of mindfulness can lead to the next, and the next, until you know in your mind that procrastination is bad, to knowing deep down in your core that it's really bad. So next time, instead of getting a notification while you are working and compulsively checking it out, Next time, feel that urge to check your phone, notice it, get curious about it, and sense the accomplishment of letting go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alina Malik, um, and today I'll be talking to you about food waste and how we can prevent it collectively as citizens, businesses, government and non-governmental institutions, restaurants, etc. Um, as a community. So, let's get started. I have witnessed too many children throw away whole fruits, barely eaten entrees, untouched home-cooked meals, and other perfectly edible food in the trash can, oblivious to how many starving people can't afford a single meal every day, and the detrimental effects contributing to climate change and other negative environmental impacts caused by wasted food. Not to mention our economy's billions of dollars wasted on unconsumed food. In 2010, in the U.S. alone, Americans have wasted 133 billion pounds of food, equaling $162 billion. 
This appalling number has since risen to over 40% of all the produce in the U.S. wasted annually. Citizens and organizations have evidently not been doing enough to address this issue in order to reach our nation's goal of cut cutting total food waste by 50% by 2030. I plead for legislators to help enforce structured policies on federal and non-governmental institutions and regulate the recycling of this food to the less fortunate despite the heavy regulation um, restraining the amount of food donated due to food safety standards. One third of all food is wasted worldwide annually. On October 1st, 2019, the UN created the Food Loss Act, which obligates local governments to devise their own action plans to reduce food waste. The national and local governments are to educate consumers and businesses and take measures to facilitate activities of non-governmental organizations to collect usable food that is going to be wasted and, and redistributed to people in need and disaster victims. Not enough changes are being established to solve this absurd issue. I'm going to share some possible solutions that schools can do to reduce um, their wasted food. The offer versus service system allows students to decline some components of school meals to provide choice and reduce waste. Share tables enable students to decline untouched food and should be heavily enforced in not just high schools, but also elementary and middle schools around the country. I must mention that myself and others have not seen a single OBS table at Troy High, which shows a lack of concern for food waste in our lunch rooms. So at Troy High, my vision is to create a school-wide compost in our courtyard. Uh, this would be an effortless practice that I hope one day will be in all schools across the nation where students will learn the constant cycle of nourishing the soil given back to the living organisms surrounding us. During lunch, we would have a separate bin for organic waste like banana peels and apple cores, so this may be filtered from non-recyclable trash and disposed of in the compost. Additionally, audits can be conducted to understand which menu items are the most popular among students and which may need a substitution students would rather eat. Schools should also install apps to donate leftovers to food banks, soup kitchens, etc. in Detroit and other local communities in need. As consumers, we can also use food redistribution apps like Gooder, Food Cowboy, Alio, USDA Food Keeper, and more. We can also build compost in our houses. Organizations and businesses can join the Food Recovery Challenge as a participant or endorser. Participants di prevent and divert wasted food by following the food recovery hierarchy. The hierarchy recommends the following actions, prevention, donation, and composting. Joining the Food Recovery Challenge saves money with tax deductibility, provides recognition, and most importantly, conserves resources, reducing our environmental footprint. Some laws established in other countries include a 2016 food, food waste law in France made it illegal for supermarkets to throw away edible food with fines upwards of 4,500 US dollars. In 2001, Japan started a food recycling law which set recycling targets for businesses to reduce food disposed during production towards animal feed, fertilizer, and methane gas capture for energy. In 2016, Italy passed a law against food waste which made it easier for food retailers to donate food to charities and food banks. Businesses will not face sanctions if they give away food past its sell-by date and will get tax cuts according to the amount of food they give away. These ideas are merely my proposals, but I need your help. We want to instill awareness for this serious issue toward legislators and people in our community who have the ability to pass bills for official regulations. Next, I'm going to share a poem that um, gives you a feeling of what people who, s who starve daily um, and how they feel. So um, it is a short and sestino with three stanzas and an envoy totaling 21 lines. Um, each line has 10 syllables and follows the pattern of the repeated final word of each sentence. It's called hunger sensation. The feeling of hunger strikes with a blow. Its effects carry an impactful toll. While some have no choice and starve daily, others volunteer to be depleted of food in cases of mental health disorders. Whichever plight, it's indeed a painful sensation. Sacrificing is painful, but ingrains gratitude like the harsh blow of a hammer. One may feel disorder internally when the famished toll strikes. This lack of substantial filling food is a difficulty some face daily. Albeit, we all must eat food daily, a starved stomach is a very painful entity to endure. 
Feeding mouths food helps diminish an out-of-the-blue blow to the metabolism. The bell's toll stops and you're no longer in disorder. The toll of the bell claiming hunger's blow declines painful bodily disorder, fulfilled daily by the intake of food. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed um, my talk and thanks. So what exactly is depression? Depression is a common illness that negatively affects how you feel and think. It can bring random moments of sadness, loneliness, anxiety, the feeling of worthlessness, and more severe thoughts such as suicide. It starts small but manifests into something problematic later on. It might seem insignificant, but it can affect many aspects of a person's life. Someone who goes through depression starts to shut other people out and doesn't socialize with others that often anymore. You become a secluded version of yourself. You start to lose interest in things that were once loved or enjoyed. It begins to take a toll on your physical health as well. Insomnia can occur because you can't stop thinking about those thoughts. Other effects are losing focus, difficulty in making decisions, and remembering things. It can cause blood vessels to tighten, resulting in a risk of cardiovascular disease. As a result of that, fatigue, weaker immune system, and migraines occur. It drains the energy out of people, and it's just horrible. If you have a family history of depression or another mood disorder, then you are at higher risk of developing it. Another major reason is stressful events in life that can be the root of depression, whether it's something small as a loss of a job or something major like a loss of a loved one. It's a key component because when an overload of chemical reactions occur, it can alter the body with long-lasting bad effects. Some other instances include drug abuse and the side effects from medication and other medical conditions. Depression can be triggered for a number of reasons, but can also just appear at one point in life, even though everything seems perfect. Often people talk about depression as a sign of weakness. This stigma is when people look at you differently when they find out that you have depression or some other mental health issue. This can lead to discrimination, and they think that because of whatever you are, that is what makes you you. It could be direct, such as a negative comment about your mental health, or indirect, such as in avoiding others because of the mental health issue. It can cause you to fall into a deeper pit of darkness and fear. Depression is terrible to go through and it's exhausting, but just know that coming out of it is the strongest and bravest thing to do. It's painful, but remember that you are never alone. Even if you think so, there will always be someone there. You may never get rid of depression, and you may continue having depression or just shortened versions of it. I'm not a doctor and I don't have a cure for it. The only treatment I believe the best is support. Find a trusted friend or an adult to talk to and to have a shoulder to lean on. Talking about depression, how depression is affecting your life can make you feel so much more better and lighter. If it's severe, talk to a doctor to find the type of treatment that fits you the best, such as a therapist or medication. If talking about it isn't your forte, write it down in a diary, journal, or even type it up. It's better to... It's better to do that instead of bottling it all up instead of uh, instead un until one day you snap. That's what I used to do and it just became a hundred times worse. Depression kicks you around, but sooner or later, you realize you're not just a survivor. You're a warrior and you're stronger than anything that depression throws your way.